There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Don't touch it! And Rish Outfield. It's evil! And I'm an Outer Man. Hello. Hello. What is this? It's it's a scary drone. Just ignore it, announcer man. It'll carry on. Okay, welcome to the uh, Dune Steve. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. The dark Rich Outfield. Yes. And today's story, it just so happens, is also dark. Today's story is Dark Detour. Really? No? Dark Detour, sorry. Okay. Dark Detour by Winifred Halliburton. Uh. Oh, okay. Sorry. Dark Detour by Lance Young. Who produced this one? This one was produced by Brian Lincoln, a many-time producer on our show. He's coming back for another tour de force. He doesn't pick the short, easy stories, does he? No, he usually picks stories, I think, specifically to challenge himself. And so uh, I think in this one, he he was uh, excited for a chance to uh, have many characters and and work on dialogue. Spoiler, spoiler! A lot of dialogue. Oh, yes, I spoiled the story. Well, no, we don't want them to know there are characters in dialogue. (laughs) Yes, spoiler alert. Announcer man, please. Movie spoilers. If you plan to see the movie. No, no, not movie spoilers. What's the other one? Spoilers! Listener discretion is advised. Yeah, that's the one, announcer man, but we were just joking. You, sir, are worse than Hitler. <laughs> okay, I, I do remember Hitler making many jokes about movie spoilers. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, okay, moving Wait, on. So let, let's find out a little bit about Lance Young. Uh, well, Lance Young was born in Auckland. Auckland oh, in California, yeah. Not Auckland, no. <laughs> Auckland, New Zealand. And he currently resides there with his family. Well, that's cool. Was, would that make him a kiwi? I believe so. Or a passion fruit. I, 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 phew, I can't remember. It's been a long time. You were nominated for a Parsec? Uh, I, yeah, I, I was. Thank you for reminding me, though. Yeah. You'll surely never get a Parsec award, but someday I predict you'll receive some type of honor for all your hard work in the field of wasting other people's valuable time. I heard that. Okay, moving on with the story. Here it is. Dark Detour by Lance Young. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to create ambiance. Hey, announcer man, is that you? (laughs) You might want to step away from your mic. See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. All right, you have a good one. Oh, that's what's making that kind of weird breathing. It's the emphysema. (laughs) You know, that's the most he's contributed in a long time. Well, you're... Mocking me, aren't you? I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you had left. Maybe you should. Okay, on with the story. Dark Detour by Lance Young There was one thing Hannibal Brogan, captain of the deep space freighter Nomad, hated with a passion, and that was losing. Especially when it involved money. It took all his self-control not to hit something when Harper claimed victory. There! From the cramped confines of his command console on the Nomad's Bridge, Brogan turned to Harper. She was buried amongst the clutter of her own overstuffed workstation, much as she buried her petite figure beneath baggy black fatigues. I don't see anything, he muttered. Flicking some loose strands of blonde hair from her pale face, Harper then pointed even more emphatically at her screen. Orbiting the third planet. The signature's weak, but it's there. Guess I owe you a drink. If I remember correctly, Skipper, the bet was for a thousand credits. At the helm console, the nomad's second officer, the thinly built Singh, scratched his goatee and said, I wouldn't hold my breath, Harper. I'm still waiting for the Skipper to settle that poker wager with me. Brogan grimaced at his two younger employees. I said I'd pay up, and I will. It should have been easy money, thought Brogan. 
He didn't need to remind them no one came this far out in the fringe unless they had to. His mind immediately turned to the small fortune and illicit weapons and drugs hidden amongst the nomad's legitimate cargo. Brogan continued, Harper, do something useful. Scan it. As more information came in, Harper whistled. Looks like we hit the jackpot. It's a starboard deep space exploration craft. Registered as the Priam, out of Bergen. Belongs to a private exploration society. It left Caledonia 30 years ago without a flight plan and was declared officially missing 10 years ago. Brogan slammed his fist down. A starboard. They haven't built one of those for over 50 years, since before the war. Everyone knew of the starbirds. They were 800 meters long, with the potential to house up to 4,000 people, depending on their internal configuration. They had been the preeminent ship of exploration for over 150 years, before cheaper, more disposable ships had shoved them aside. They got the name Starbird from their trademark swept-back wing design and the extended bridge that resembled a bird's head. Big ship, big crew, skipper, said Singh. How are we going to handle any survivors? Brogan grinned, his white teeth shining against his dark skin. We'll find a way, my lad. We'll find a way. Brogan patched himself down to the engine room and told the two engineers, Zoo and Garibaldi, to meet them at the airlock. What about the cargo? Cyrus won't be happy if we're late. Brogan pounded his fist on the console. Cyrus can kiss my ass. That ship is a hell of a lot more important than Cyrus getting his cargo a few days late. We do this right, and we'll all be set. I had no idea you were such a humanitarian boss. What can I say? That rescue and salvage bonus we'll get brings out my soft side. Does that mean equal salvage and rescue shares? Asked Singh. Yeah, equal shares between the rest of you. Ignoring the knowing glances between Harper and Singh, Brogan continued. Go get ready. I'll get us docked. Aye, aye, Skipper. Harper and Singh got up from their consoles and shuffled past. Brogan let his hands roam over the controls. He usually let one of the others dock. But this discovery and its potential riches had given him a burst of energy. Brogan had owned the Nomad for over ten years, ever since leaving the Federal Interstellar Navy. He encouraged stories that the previous owner had had an unfortunate accident after arguing with him. His actual secret was far worse, and one he'd take to the grave. But another year and he'd have his mother fully paid back. Nomad. Lock onto Priam's upper docking ring and commence docking procedure B. A feminine voice replied. Acknowledged. He monitored the operation, ready to intervene if necessary. The Nomad was a hundred meters long and shaped like a high-tech brick. Most of its space was devoted to its engines and cargo hold. It could haul a lot, but a full-size starboard would be a stretch. Brogan prayed the starboard's engines worked, or he'd have some hard choices to make. The Nomad slowly hovered over the Priam till it was in position over the topside airlock. Then it latched on with its metal grippers. Brogan thumped the console. Time to save some lives. He made his way down to the airlock where Harper and Singh were waiting patiently for the others. The Nomad had a crew of seven, a mixture of veteran shippers, rookies, adventure seekers, and people who needed to be out of circulation for a while. As Brogan checked his blaster, the behemoth-like cave appeared in the doorway, the rest of the crew trailing behind him. When he saw them, he said, You two girls coming as well? Without waiting for a reply, he continued, Sing, you should leave it to the real men like me and Harper. That reminds me, when am I going to get my money? Singh ran a hand through his hair. I'm getting my accounts in order. Tell you what, double or nothing on how many survivors there. Harper frowned. <laughs> you shouldn't be betting on people's lives. Cave rolled his eyes. Sorry, mother. He turned to Singh. All right, 50 survivors. Ignoring Harper's continued grimace, Singh replied. I say 100. He extended his hand. Cave wrapped it up in his own meaty hand, and they shook on it. If you two have finished flooding, maybe we can get to the reason we're here. 
What's the sitch, boss? Asked Cave. Brogan smiled. We got some would-be explorers to rescue. Harper, the link-up between the two ships should have activated the Priam's emergency systems by now. Give us a run-through. Harper quickly skimmed through the information on a wrist pad. Engines are offline, reason unknown. A crew complement, 110. How many survivors? Harper smiled. Sorry, doesn't say. Cave slapped him on the shoulder. Don't be too anxious to lose your money. What else does it say? Asked Brogan, tapping his fingers on the wall. The air's a bit stale, but still breathable. We won't need rebreathers. I'm downloading a schematic for your data pads. Assuming they haven't done too much unrecorded customizing of the interior, it should be relatively accurate. Last time you said that, I ended up in the waste recycler. Harper smiled sweetly. I don't know how that happened. Cave feigned laughter. Ha ha ha. Brogan turned to Cave. Enough. Open it. The airlock door grinded open. The dry, unrecycled air of the Priam wafted back to them. Beyond was a long, narrow access tunnel, with a ladder leading down to a poorly lit chamber. I know I ain't going down first, so I'm gonna need a volunteer. He pointed to the young man in the rear. Messenger, congratulations. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's cool, boss, replied Messenger. Brogan laughed. <laughs> You're a funny guy, Messenger. He grabbed him by the scruff of his jumpsuit and shoved him towards the hatch. Now get moving before I stop laughing. Sighing, Messenger began descending. Halfway down, he hesitated and looked back up at them. Um, it's real dark down there. Brogan tossed him down a torch, lighting up the area immediately below. He pointed his blaster in Messenger's direction. Now hurry it up or I'll send you down the hard way. Messenger hastily picked up the pace, jumping down the last few rungs. He gave the area a quick sweep, yelling back, Looks clear, boss! While hardly a ringing endorsement, the others wasted no time in following. The Priam systems had powered up the emergency lighting, providing just enough illumination to see without enhancers. Not that there was much for any of them to see in the gray metal-encased airlock. The group waited with equal degrees of apprehension and excitement as Cave worked on the inner airlock door. All had heard stories about ships disappearing in the vastness of space, reappearing with their crews changed in some way, or dead. But that's all they were, stories. Still, the nerves never entirely went away. Cave looked up. Got it. The door silently cycled open and they peered nervously into the chamber beyond. Brogan led the way in. It was a small control room with a workstation. With all that work up, he was almost disappointed when nothing appeared to greet them. Brogan turned to them. Time to head out. Garibaldi, report in when you get to the engine room. He slapped Garibaldi's shoulder. And be careful. No problem, boss. Harper, said Brogan. What's closer, the bridge or the cryer chamber? Harper checked the schematic. Cryo chamber. Then let's move. Cave, you're on point. Decades-old dust scattered as they advanced. Brogan's eyes roamed greedily over the Priam's fixtures and fittings. I'd heard stories about starbirds, but I had no idea. Starbirds are designed to be in space for years, even decades at a time. There's no such thing as wasted space on a starbird. Singh shook his head. Man, this place could finally clear all my debts. I could go home. Brogan snorted. Please, I'll give you a month before you are up to your eyeballs and gambling debts again. Wanna bet? I rest my case. Singh grimaced. Force of habit. The group halted when they found their way barred by an old-fashioned manual door with a big round handle that had to be twisted to get it open. Cave wheeled it open, and the door replied with a nerve-rending screech. I haven't seen these before. They keep chambers segregated. In an emergency like this, they slam themselves shut, sealing the crew in. Pointing to an open one, Brogan said, Looks like some have malfunctioned. Messenger swung around, 
letting loose with his blaster, tearing up nearby equipment and showering the room with sparks. After several seconds, he stopped. Everyone looked at him silently until Singh grinned. Nice shooting, Tex. Who are you going to go after next? The toaster? Messenger reddened. Uh, sorry, guys. I thought I heard a voice. I knew we should have left Daisy here back in the Nomad. I heard something. I think I heard it too. Brogan studied them. Messenger he could ignore due to his inexperience. But Harper wasn't one to make up stories. What did it say? Welcome. Messenger nodded in agreement. Could it be survivors? Unlikely. The life support's just come on and it takes a day to thaw someone out of a cryo chamber. The only people around should be us. Brogan mulled that over. Probably just a malfunctioning voice message. But everyone stay frosty. He jabbed a finger into Messenger's chest. From now on, don't shoot unless I give the order. Don't make me regret renting you that blaster. Messenger nodded nervously. Yeah, sorry boss. They continued into the Priam's interior. Equipment and papers were randomly strewn about. Lights and consoles flickered on and off as they passed. But there was no obvious structural damage that would have marooned the ship here. Boss, check this out, said Harper. Brogan grimaced at the collection of red stains on the floor. Harper looked at him expectantly, but he didn't have any answers. Just keep moving. After several minutes, Brogan paused to examine some paperwork. A horrific screech filled the chamber, ending with a metallic thud. Brogan spun around, about to fire his blaster. Harper raised her hands. Easy there, boss. Embarrassed by his loss of face, Brogan pointed his blaster at the crewman closest to the door. Damn it, Singh, do not slam the doors. Honestly, Skipper, it wasn't me. The door slammed itself. I never touched it. Harper tried to defuse the situation. Just a malfunctioning door mechanism. Brogan glared at Singh. Fine. Then he stomped away to take the lead. Singh looked like he was about to collapse into a puddle on the floor. I could have been an accountant, but I had to love casinos. Cave shoved him forward. Move it, hero. With the crew's nerves on edge, it was a relief when they finally reached the entrance to the cryo chambers. A large metallic door that bore the inscription Cryogenic Storage Chamber in big yellow letters barred their way. Beneath that, it read, Authorized Personnel Only. Not anymore, thought Brogan. He nodded to Harper. Open her up. While the others examined the hallway's contents, Harper plugged in her portable data pad and went to work. Where do you learn this crap, Harper? Asked Cave, leaning in close. Doing things I shouldn't have been doing. She said with a grin. Cave leaned in closer. You've been with Brogan a year, right? Her face softened. Has it been that long? How'd you end up here? Harper shrugged. His last sense officer ran off. Said he'd give me a run to prove myself. Cave lowered his voice. Joking aside, I hear you killed a guy in a bar fight and ran off. Harper's eyes darkened. Someone's being a bit nosy. Just making conversation. Anytime you need to talk. Harper smiled. Let me guess, your door is always open. She sighed. (sighs) Well, it does get lonely being the only woman. Perhaps after this is finished... Cave smiled lecherously. Really? Harper pushed him away and left. (laughs) No. Now get over there. You're breaking my concentration. Chagrined, Cave backed up and mouthed to Brogan, who had been watching the proceedings quietly from a distance. Doesn't like guys, eh? Brogan smiled. No, she just doesn't like you. Got it, Skipper! The door rumbled open, and the group stepped curiously through. The room was a mixture of cryotubes, cooling units, and tangles of wire hanging from the ceiling, with an industrial chemical smell in the air. The control unit was situated in the middle of the room, while the three-meter-tall cryotubes were organized in rows. A quick count revealed over a hundred individual tubes, all occupied, except for a dozen empty tubes near the front. Brogan moved in for a closer look. 
He frowned at the sight. Damn. Look how shriveled up they are. Kind of remind me of uh, ancient Egyptian mummies. Guess we're too late? Yeah. Sorry, lads. No rescue bonus this time. This is incredible! You seen anything like this before, boss? Brogan nodded. In the Navy. Deep space patrols, mostly. Saves on food if they keep you on ice until you reach the frontier. He turned to the others. Uh, Let's get up to the bridge. Over at the control panel, Harper looked up at him. Uh, boss? They're not dead? They sure as hell look dead, replied Brogan, tapping one of the chambers. Well, prepare to be amazed. According to all this fancy equipment, none of these tubes is operational. In fact, according to this, they ran out of power years ago, but... And this is the really strange part. They're still technically alive. It's just that their vitals are very, very weak. Brogan took a hard look at the supposedly dead units. Then what's keeping them alive? And don't say love. Hell if I know. But it's not the ship. That's crazy. Miss Perfect must be reading it wrong. Take a look, said Harper. But Brogan waved him away. I'll admit it's weird. Harper cocked an eyebrow. Uh, All right, very weird. But the reason doesn't matter for now. No one deserves that. He patted the glass. Harper, can you put them out of their misery? She pursed her lips together. With this unknown energy source, I'm not sure I can turn them off. Brogan shuddered at the shriveled corpses looking back at them. Just try. Turning them off will be doing them a favor. After several minutes of negotiating her way through the operating system, Harper said, I think I have it. She glanced at Brogan. You sure you want to do this? Technically, it is murder. Well, thank you, Professor, replied Brogan with a frown. I don't call that living. Put the poor devils out of their misery. Yeah, get the bloody thing over with. This place is giving me the creeps. What's the matter, tough guy? Afraid they're going to come alive and get you? Shut it. Or I'll stuff you into one of those high-tech coffins. Knock it off, you two. Harper, do it. Taking a deep breath, Harper hit the button. A low, moaning noise echoed through the room. All the lights dimmed. Then a loud, animalistic hissing filled the room. Singh rubbed his ears. What the hell was that? The group exchanged uneasy glances. Probably static, said Harper. She looked at Brogan for support. Right? Brogan looked away, unwilling to show the doubt he felt. Yeah, right. Cave grinned. Maybe the ship's haunted. Don't be stupid. A few malfunctions and you people get the willies. Let's get to the bridge. Cave turned to sing. Too bad, mate. Guess I win the bet now. What do you mean? Cave smiled. With no survivors, I have the closest guess. That means I win. That's not fair. Cave shoved a thumb at the corpses. Tell that to them. The electrical activity they had noticed on the way to the cryo chamber dramatically picked up. Equipment flared up, and view screens flashed to life, then quickly died out. As he flinched from another spark, Singh said, What was that you said about the ship being haunted, Skipper? Brogan tried to ignore the activity around him. No need to wet yourself. The ship's been here for years with no maintenance. I'd be more surprised if everything was running fine. The door in front of him suddenly slammed shut. Harper raised an eyebrow. Brogan raised his hand. Not a word. Any of you. Ignoring the uneasy glances they shared between themselves, Brogan pulled open the door with a strenuous wrench. After several minutes, they reached the Priam's command levels. Brogan's radio crackled. Boss, you there? Garibaldi, about damn time. Sorry, this place is like a maze. Plus we're hearing weird noises all over the place. The others all gave Brogan inquiring looks, which he studiously ignored. Don't cry to your mama. What are the engines like? Garibaldi whistled. (whistles) No good, Skipper. Everything looks pretty torn up. It's like a tornado went through here. Is that what stranded them here? Data helped. Frowning, 
Brogan ignored the insolent reply and said through gritted teeth, Can you rig something up? Have to look around first. But if we bring some equipment over, I'm sure we can generate something together. Keep me posted. We'll be on the bridge. Ancients don't tear themselves up, said Harper pointedly. Brogan shrugged. And ships don't strand themselves. We'll worry about the why later. The Priam's bridge door was an exact copy of the one that led into the cryo chamber. Only it wasn't budging, and by the look of the broken lock, no amount of hacking by Harper was going to get it open. Brogan turned to his resident tech. Cave, can you get it moving? Cave took a hard look at the tangled mess of wires. It'll be a few minutes, boss. Then stop wasting time talking to me. Mellowing out in your old age. Find yourself something to do or you'll see just how mellow I am. Harper raised her hands apologetically just as Cave yelled. Skipper, we're in. Finally, said Brogan. That was a long five minutes. The door rumbled open and the group slowly stepped inside. Holy mother. Whatever had torn up the engines had done a similar job to the bridge. Computer equipment was tossed about, shredded wires hanging from the walls and ceiling. But what attracted everyone's attention was the simple office chair sticking out of the wall, like someone had picked it up and rammed it in. I don't know about you guys, but this place is starting to freak me out. You big pussy. I've seen worse in that heap of a room I rent to you. Harper, start dumping the computer core. There should be a working socket around here somewhere. Harper replied with a mock salute. On it, Skipper. What about the rest of us, boss? Do a sweep, make a note of anything interesting, and stay out of my way. With that warning, Brogan went off to explore. Is he always like that? You should see him on a bad day. Brogan hiked over to the other side of the crescent-shaped bridge. It was dominated by a large viewport looking down to the planet below, and was covered in countless workstations, all positioned in seemingly random spots. Along the sides of the bridge were at least a dozen small private offices for all the ship's senior officers. Brogan went along until he found the one he wanted, the captain's office. The room was almost as big as the entire bridge of the Nomad. Brogan paused to examine the pictures and certificates covering the wall. Captain's certificate awarded to Josiah Crombie. Nice name, Josiah. Beside it was a picture of a tall, bearded man Brogan presumed to be Crombie, surrounded by smiling officials. Brogan rolled his eyes. Suck up. For all his awards, Crombie was just another decomposing body down in the cryo chamber. His feet aching, Brogan focused on Crombie's plush desk chair. He spun the chair around, stumbling back a couple of paces in shock as he discovered the desiccated corpse of Captain Josiah Crombie staring back at him. Cautiously, he moved closer to examine the body in greater detail. It looked like someone had jabbed dozens of office items into his body. The most prominent was a pen stuck in his forehead. Damn. Crombie's computer wasn't going to provide any answers. The thing looked like someone had put a chainsaw to it. Whatever had happened here, Brogan had no intention of letting it happen to him. He stormed out of the office. Harper, what's the status of that log? Harper looked up from the console, but before she could reply, Singh jumped out at him. Skipper, I I don't want to be a downer, but we found a few dead bodies, and it looks like they were torn apart. One had a cup sticking out of his head. A cup! Brogan pushed past them. Harper, the log... She shook her head. Sorry, boss, the corruption's too great. She narrowed her eyes. But I did find a note indicating they tried to detonate the engines. Why would they do that? Brogan could sense the panic in the air and raised his hands. Let's not jump to any wild conclusions. I just wish there was a bloody conclusion to jump to. Brogan resisted the urge to smack him. The radio suddenly crackled. Boss, we got a situation here. No shit. We have a situation ourselves, Garibaldi. A half a dozen dead bodies down here. There's all kinds of crap sticking out of them. Some look like they've been torn apart. Looks like they were trying to detonate the engines. We're also hearing all kinds of weird noises down there. Zoo's gone to... What What the hell? Holy... The communication ended with the echo of gunfire. 
Before anyone could speak, a shriek jolted the room. Ah! Messenger! yelled Harper. Messenger was wrapped up in Crombie's arms, and a translucent yellow energy flowed between them. Messenger's eyes glowed, and he went quiet. Brogan drew his blaster, the rest of the crew quickly following. He looked at Harper, who responded with an equally concerned look. Brogan didn't know what was going on, but he wasn't about to give up a payday like this easily. Trying to sound calm, Brogan asked, Who are you? I am from the world below. I live as energy, hopping from host to host. When they came to my world, I decided to live with them, to see the stars. I hid on their ship through its living parts. Brogan scratched his head. Living parts? Bioorganic circuitry. Right. So, what happened here? When I take a host, I absorb their life force. The senior crew objected. They said I was a threat, a disease. They quarantined most of the crew into the cryotubes while they tried to hunt me. Messenger smiled blandly. But I have spent my life hiding and hunting. I disabled their communications and computers and I hunted them. In desperation, they tried to detonate the engines and destroy the ship. So I destroyed them. Unfortunately, that trapped me here, forcing me to live off the ones who slept. But now you are here, and I can leave. Harper pointed to the planet out beyond the viewport. You want us to take you back? Brogan licked his lips. Maybe we can come to an arrangement and take you back, if you're willing to cooperate. Messenger's eyes glowed brighter. No deals. They tried to make a deal and then kill me. I will take your ship and I will see the stars. Try to stop me and you will die. Brogan snapped. No way you're taking my ship, you alien son of a bitch. Brogan began firing on the possessed men. The others quickly adding their firepower. Messenger and Crombie fell back under the combined blasts, pieces of flesh exploding off them. But they continued to stagger forward until caves sent a round each into their legs and they tumbled to the ground. Even then, they continued to crawl forward with their arms, the mangled heads of Messenger and Crombie speaking as one. We're We're coming. coming. Brogan fired a shot into each one's head to put an end to their rambling. Everything was quiet until Cave shook his head. Too bad. I liked Messenger. He always lost at cards. Should we bring him back for burial? Brogan took a long, hard look at the body. He deserves better, despite being a worthless tosser. But he ain't coming aboard the Nomad. Not after that thing's been inside him. But... The skipper's right. It's too big a risk. Brogan nodded at him, thankful for the support. This place just became more trouble than it's worth. Unless anyone has any objections, I suggest we leave. There's no point. If this thing can live in the ship's systems, it's probably already on board the Nomad. Not necessarily. It can probably only move through the Priam because it has organic circuitry, something our own glorious captain was too cheap to install. Singh smiled thinly. Who knew your cheapness would come in handy, boss? Ha ha, let's go. As they entered the corridor, Harper asked, What about the others? Brogan paused in mid-stride. Your conscience is going to get me killed. He grabbed his radio. Garibaldi. Zoo, if you're there, we're heading back. If you don't want to stay here, you better move too. There was no reply, and Harper said, We can't just leave them. Brogan shook his head. It's too dangerous to go to the engines. They're on their own, said Brogan as he rechecked his blaster. Now let's get the hell out of here. With Brogan on point, they sprinted back down the endless series of corridors they had followed to get there. It was impossible for them to ignore the uneasy feeling that the alien was aware of every step they took. Lights blazed out as they passed, screens flared to life, and small objects shuddered side to side before flying out at them. Seeing groaned as one grazed his head. Ah, I knew I should have stayed on Nomad. Something we can both agree on. 
replied Cave, pushing past him. Just stay calm, guys. We keep our heads and we can make it. Despite her words, Brogan detected a slight fragility in her tone. Not that he could blame her. He wasn't in his element here either. But he'd kept his ship against pirates, shipjackers, and a dozen different law enforcement agencies. He'd be damned if some alien was going to take it from him. A door slammed shut in front of him. Wrenching it open, Brogan gestured upwards. Uh, This the best you got? He ran down the corridor, and as he turned the corner, he came within centimeters of becoming a messenger clone as dozens of deceased crew members in various states of decomposition appeared mumbling. My ship. Brogan lurched back, firing randomly in their direction. As the front ones tumbled, he ran back up the corridor. Back! 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 Barging past the others, Brogan took up a covering position at the closest door. Harper and Singh quickly joined him. Cave was moving to catch up when he tripped on a piece of debris and fell to the ground with the crew just steps behind. Boss! Brogan instinctively stepped forward, but as he did so, a wave of crewmen washed over Cave. Brogan looked away. He fired wildly into the crowd and hoped one of his shots put Cave out of his misery. Slamming the door, he yelled, Damn it! You have to let him in! Cave was my friend, but he's already dead, and I stopped being a hero in the Navy. I ain't opening that door, and I'm not letting you risk it either. We could have tried, said Harper, stepping forward. This isn't the time to face your past and be a hero. Harper paled. What are you talking about? Singh looked at them both. Yeah, what are you talking about? The old story is someone who finds themselves unable to take the stress of combat and flees. But in this case, that someone stole a ship and left their comrades behind to face certain death. Harper looked away. How did you know? You think I'd let anyone on my ship without checking into them first? You hid your life well. But not well enough. We've all done things we're not proud of. I'm not judging you. I know how hard combat is. But as long as you're on my ship, you follow my orders. I still remember some things from the Navy. An awkward silence prevailed until Singh asked, Were those things after us? They sure as hell went out for a picnic, replied Brogan, glad for a chance to change the subject. Lord knows where the other ones are. We need another way back to the ship now. Any ideas? Harper, you're still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Harper wiped a stray lock of hair from her face and pressed her lips together in thought. She pointed up. We can take the maintenance ducts. They'll be tight, but they should take us right back to the docking port. Sounds like a plan, replied Brogan. He ripped open the nearest hatchway. (laughs) Ladies first. Your old heart, boss. I meant sing. Still, if you insist. Singh feigned laughter. Ha ha ha. While Harper slowly stuck her head inside. When she saw it was clear, she climbed right in. Brogan crawled in after her, followed by Singh. With his wide shoulders, Brogan had trouble squeezing his way through the access way. The pipes running along the sides making a speedy journey impossible. To make things worse, Harper had to stop frequently to get her bearings. You want to pick up the pace there, Harper? I'm moving as fast as I bloody can. Well, move faster. Ah! Singh was cut off as a trio of corpses fell on top of him from an axis way above him. Help me! He cried as yellow alien energy flowed around him, then entered his body. Brogan looked on in horror as Singh went into convulsions, then suddenly stopped. The group started moving towards him. Despite his reservations about firing on another member of his crew, Brogan raised his blaster and forced himself to fire into the group. After several seconds, the group, including Singh, shuddered to a halt. But Brogan could see more advancing behind them. We need to get out of here, now! Harper just gaped at him. Harper, get it together! Brogan's verbal slap shocking her back into action, Harper nodded. Right, on it. She came to the nearest gate and kicked it out, Mm. sending it to the ground with a clang. It's clear. Brogan fired a few more shots down the access way, then leapt down to join her. Where are we? Harper did a quick check on her wrist pad. Sick to F12, not far from the airlock. 
They ran to the door, coming out into yet another of the Priam's myriad of corridors. Which way? Harper pointed to the left. Brogan shoved her forward. Go! As he careened after her, Brogan wasn't sure if it was his imagination playing tricks or the creature indulging in one last defiant act. But it felt like the Priam was coming apart beneath them. There was a definite background rumble. Whatever was happening, Brogan had no intention of staying aboard to find out. He could see Harper approaching the next junction, just a little bit further, and he knew they would be safe on the Nomad. Harper suddenly pulled up. Garibaldi, you son of a bitch! You nearly gave me a heart attack. Garibaldi, the engineer, was covered in scratches, blood pouring from a wound in his shoulder. Sorry, we should get going. Where's Zoo? Asked Harper. Please, we'll have to move. Brogan raised his blaster. Harper, move back. That's not Garibaldi. Harper jumped back. Garibaldi smiled as his eyes turned yellow. How did you know? Garibaldi's never that polite. Garibaldi reached out with his hands. He was so unhappy. I've given him peace. Let me do the same for you. Brogan sent a shot straight into Garibaldi's head. As he stepped over him, he muttered, I got enough peace. A swarm of Priam crewmen appeared at the end of the corridor. Hissing, they charged toward them. Go! yelled Brogan, firing back at them. Running after Harper, Brogan knew the airlock was only a short distance away, but the final sprint took an eternity. As crewmen popped out of side rooms and corridors like insects, a trio of corpses emerged in front of them. Brogan raised his blaster, the splatter from his headshots decorating the corridor. Beside him, Harper whipped around every few steps and sent shots towards the ever-increasing mob. It didn't stop them, but the falling bodies slowed them down. Brogan reached the ladder first and flew up the rungs. Harper wasn't far behind, but neither were the crew. They were barely a few centimeters away as she frantically clambered up the ladder. Brogan fired a few blasts down the narrow confines of the airlock. The shots were so close, Harper's hair was singed from the heat. Brogan methodically blasted away their shriveled arms, sending them tumbling back down. Brogan's blaster suddenly fizzled out as its power pack gave out. He threw it down, striking a crewman in the head and causing him to fall backwards, taking a few others with him. Move your ass, Harper. As she struggled to the top, Brogan grabbed the back of her jumpsuit, pulling her in. As soon as she was clear, he hit the airlock button. The door sealed shut as several crewmen tried to reach in, crushing their limbs in its tight metallic grip. They heard the creature let out a primal... (laughs) Brogan yelled, Nomad! Emergency detach! The Nomad's calm reply was in sharp contrast to Brogan's frantic command. Order acknowledged. They felt a violent shove as the Nomad detached itself from the Priam and moved a short distance away. But Brogan had no intention of leaving just yet. Nomad, when we reach minimum safe distance, target the Priam with our main weapons. Order acknowledged. Update. The Priam is approaching on collision course. Impact in 20 seconds. Brogan and Harper ran to the nearest viewport, cursing to each other. Damn it! It looked like the alien had decided to use up the last of its energy, taking them out. Fire main weapons! Which part of the ship would you like targeted? I I don't care! Just hit it! Please specify. The engines! Hit the engines! The Nomad's two main cannons fired into the century-old Starbird, tearing it apart and reducing it within seconds to a tangle of metal and plastic. The Nomad shook violently from the close proximity of the blast, knocking the pair to the ground. Brogan cursed as he saw the weird yellow energy emerge from the ruins of the Priam. Bloody hell! Wisps of yellow energy flowed from the wreckage, coalescing into an angry alien face that opened its mouth and charged towards the Nomad. Why won't it die? Maybe it can't die. Not what I want to hear. The lights flickered and the ship shuddered violently under the impact. Harper looked up. The shield is failing. The hell it is. Ignoring the noise around him, Brogan rushed to a workstation and worked frantically to strengthen the shield. Come on. Hold, damn it, hold! 
The nomad jerked suddenly, tossing them to the ground and knocking the lights out. He took a deep breath, fearing the worst. It's dissolving! yelled Harper as she staggered to the viewport. Joining her, Brogan saw the creature's yellow energy slowly fading away. The nomad's emergency lighting kicked in. What remained of the creature dissolved into the nothingness of space. The pair slumped back to the ground. After several silent minutes, Harper said, What now? Brogan looked up from the ground and studied her. Finally, he picked himself up and extended a hand to help Harper up. He turned away to look out at the debris field that made up the remains of the Priam. Skipper? She said softly. Thought I'd left the killing business when I got demobbed from the Navy. Harper smiled thinly. So did I. For what it's worth, I thought you kept it together pretty well considering the circumstances. The fear's still there, but I can control it better now. He pointed to her torn jumpsuit. Harper, go take a few hours break and get yourself cleaned up. I expect you on the bridge at 0900 hours, ready for duty. We have a cargo to deliver, and now we're late. It's actually Harker. Peyton Harker. I wanted something close to my real name. Can the two of us fly the ship by ourselves? We're about to find out. Enjoy your rest, because we'll be spending the next week running on stims. As Harker left, she turned back and asked, Is it true you killed a man to get this ship? (laughs) I wish. She raised an eyebrow. So, what is the truth? Brogan smiled tightly. Sorry, Harper. Uh, Or should I say Harker. It'll take more than a shared encounter with an alien to earn you that information. I thought so, replied Harker with a smile. As she turned the corner, she called out, Tell your mother I said hi. Author's note. I was thinking up stories, and I liked the idea of a haunted house in space. From there, I added Brogan, the nomad's crew, and the creature behind it all. Brogan was the easiest character to come up with, and the least modified from my original draft, the other characters, especially Harper, went through various changes before they were finally nailed down. Hey, Big. Yes? (laughs) Watch me try and pull a rabbit out of a hat. Oh, not that again. Nothing up my sleeve. No, uh, can you give me a cast list, please? (laughs) Sure. Uh, How many people do you think get that? Three. Back when that movie came out, it was already too long. That was like 10 years ago now, wasn't it, or was it not? I think it was late 90s. Yeah. It had already been too long for anybody to get those jokes. And now it's 10 years later, and you're still trotting them out. They should be remaking that by now. (laughs) They probably are. 10 years is too long to wait, folks. Yeah. Okay, a cast list for today's stories. First of all, today's story was produced by Brian Lincoln. Now! Who we all know and love. The narrator and Cave was played by Big Anklevich. Rish Outfield played Brogan and Sing. Harper was played by Philippa Ballantyne. Messenger was played by Ray Saltrelli. Garibaldi was played by Ayub Cote. And the computer voice was by Liz Lincoln. Neat. Sound effects? Yeah, there were sound effects. Do I have to go to the show notes to find out about it? Yes, you do. Uh, Hey, all of those voice people probably have websites and stuff. Maybe we could put those in the show notes. Yes, I think we shall. Since we do that in every other show, I'll go ahead and do it in this one, too. Oh, see, I've never gone to the website, so I wouldn't know that you do these sort of things. Something that you might want to consider doing is uh, having a button where people can download the episode uh, rather than just, you know, letting iTunes do it for them. That's a good idea. Maybe I should do that. You know what else I, I, I ought to probably get is a button that people could just donate to the show with. Oh, shoot. You know, can you imagine how many donations we would have had had there been a button? Yeah, I'll, I'll put one of those on right away. And you can just click on that button and you'll be able to... I'll make one that you can donate $5 a month or $5 a quarter or just any amount that you want. 
Don't hurt yourself, son. Oh, let's no, let's not worry it. about that. Kind I'll of do thing. it. No, it's, that's just a waste of time. They have the money. I've got the time. And being pretty is my only crime. One of two, actually. <laughs> the uh, story produced by Brian Lincoln. Once again, we'll remind you, he has his own podcast, fullcastpodcast.com. And something awesome that he does in bed is, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't go there. Sorry, I went there. Something awesome he does every time he produces an episode for us that he usually does an episode of his podcast about each episode he does for us. Yeah. And it's, I'm not going to go as far as to say it's riveting, but it's nailing probably or stapling. Yes. Stapling, I think is probably right. You, you feel like you're stapled in place. You just can't move away from the speakers. Some of the things that you can hear him talk about, you know, I thought we might mention a little of it, too, because we talked about it as we listened to the episode. He was saying he's going to mention dropping, you know, in stories when, when you're reading a story. A lot of times you'll have to have a he said or a she said or a messenger said or Harper said, etc. And in audio, especially when you have someone separate a different actual actor not just somebody putting on a different voice but you have actually different actors for all these various characters you don't need those things anymore for the most part if they say he said slyly and winked or something like that then you obviously want to leave those in but the ones that just say he said she said brogan said seeing said you know, those things you can drop because you know that that's seeing because it's the guy that's talking with that particular accent. So you're telling me you have dropped he sheds and she sheds in? Sorry. I never had a she shed to By drop. she sure? <laughs> You've dropped those in stories. I have. Know. I've done you that. Bastard. <laughs> that's right. I've done the unthinkable. I've done that to authors that donated their story to us out of the goodness of their own heart. I just myrtleized their story. I just cut it to pieces, threw out the parts I didn't like. You know, as much as that makes you a, an a-hole, there have been times when I've heard on our podcasts and others a lot of the he saids and she saids, and it might have been better, especially when there's only two characters talking, right? to not have the he saids and she saids and she asked and he answered for story flow, for just... If there was an argument or a conversation or, you know, something intense, it almost gives you a breath to hear him say he shouted, you know, rather than just having the guy shout. Yeah, definitely. But hopefully Brian will talk about how he determined whether one was appropriate whether to drop or not. Or not. So, so it'll be interesting to hear his justification for that. Yeah, I, I've, I've done that several times where I've got people that are having a conversation back and forth and I've just gone ahead and, you know, in, in the written story, they're necessary. They're important. It's irritating trying to read it if you don't have that because at a certain point you get lost or sometimes, and especially with this story, you know, there's... Do I almost said dozens of characters. There's several characters. Well, if you count the undead. <laughs> and they're all talking. They're all, you know, six of them or, or so in the room at the same time. And it's they all have my voice. Yeah. Person. Greedy. But, uh, you know, they're having conversations with one another. And, you know, sometimes you just got to remove those things to let the conversations flow. But if you're reading it on print, you won't know who is saying what otherwise if you don't have them in there. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Just the whole idea. And there was a couple of times as we were listening to it where Singh comes in and says a line. And you're like, he must have dropped that because how could we know that it was Singh otherwise? <laughs> It must have said Singh said before. Are we just guessing? No, it had to have been there. But, you know, I've actually had an author after our story had run say, oh, man, it's interesting hearing it in audio because there's a lot of he saids and she saids and maybe it would have been better without them. But and I thought, you know, that's funny because I actually dropped a bunch of them already. Uh, <laughs> so there were twice as many to begin with. Well, what we do with the full cast or semi-full cast in my case. Full cast podcast? Dot com. It, it, it makes that even easier to drop the he saids, she saids. If you've got a man and a woman talking, you don't need right. e you know a third of those. But just one narrator doing the whole story, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't yeah, want to drop it. Unless necessary. you've got a high voice you're doing and a low voice. You know, <sighs> you know what I'm saying. As somebody who wants to do a kick-ass Rish Outfield performance, <laughs> then maybe you wouldn't have to. But... 
I find uh, you guilty, Rish Outfield. Uh, yeah, but maybe I was joking. <laughs> well, maybe. maybe. Wow, he's really... Come on over here, announcer man. No. No, seriously, come come join us. It, okay, you can come out of the announcer booth. like he wants to join in on the conversation. No way. Come on. Come on. I'm just an announcer. You've said it before, you're better than Don Pardo, right? Don Pardo ain't got nothing on me. That thing. So you could... No? You're not going to join us? Not this time. Okay, maybe later. Okay. Anyhow, I, I, I think I was saying something. Oh, just to the, the, the varying the voices and all that stuff. I guess I would be too afraid, honestly. I don't mind rewriting an entire story for somebody or insisting they give us a, a, you know, a new ending where we find out what happens. But I would be afraid to shave somebody's dialogue and all that. So different strokes for different folks. Um, Different strokes to move the world. Yes, it does. It takes. <laughs> Whoa, I thought it for sure announcer man would leap in with the singing thing. He didn't. He must have warmed to it. <laughs> I guess I should have gotten this out of the way a long, long time ago. Never too late. Friggin' great story. Dark detour. <laughs> this guy, Lance Young. That's got to be a fake name. I, as far as I know, has never sent us a story before. The name isn't familiar, but it is something that we talk about a lot. Um, I knew I wanted it long before we finished the story. It just had a flow and an interesting setting and uh, just the characters' voices I liked. And I knew this would work in audio and it was up to us to screw it up. You know what I mean? <laughs> and there. so we did. Oh, damn right. Yeah, so I'd said the, you know, casting into my head, the second page kind of thing. And, and I find that that happens from time to time. Every once in a while, there's a story where I I have to think about it afterward and go, hmm, do we want to do this one? This is going to be a lot of work, you know, kind of thing. And this one wasn't like that at all. It's just like, uh, scale from one to ten, ten. Let's do it. But this story had the advantage of being... You know, in a setting that I love, which is the science fiction horror category. Right. We were talking about that when we had the conversation about space opera. You know, uh -huh. what is alien? What is event horizon? Right. Do and they count as space opera or do they count as horror or what? And whatever they count as, this is that. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I just like those. And, it, and you'll get one like every other year, every three years or whatever. I suppose it's an expensive genre to make movies in. And that's Could why be. you don't get them a lot. I, I I don't know. What about Moon? Did Moon Moon didn't count as that, huh? Because that wasn't there was no evil scary thing. There was just clones. Yeah, I, it didn't have any horror elements really. I mean, there there were a couple of moments that were scary, but that that one was a little harder sci-fi than you usually have, more cerebral sci-fi. And ag again, people don't make those movies very often either yeah, because even much less they're often. money black holes although moon did all right and i think it's because it was so cheap to make yeah well it couldn't have cost much all they had to do is put together a set and get one actor <laughs> that was something we should have watched together that was a good movie yeah i liked it ridley scott is making another movie like that called prometheus right now that's tangential tan that's somewhat a prequel to Alien. And mm. uh, so it'll be fun. I don't know why they don't make more sci-fi horror movies like that. Just anything set in a spaceship that's claustrophobic and scary. And, and, and Moon was certainly claustrophobic. Yeah. Although it was a space station rather than... Or what, what, what do you call a... It was a moon base. A moon base? Is that different than a space station? I think so. A space station has to be off of a planet just in space. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest okay. we use it. Okay. I don't know. Do you like movies like that? Here's another one that I know you've seen with your pants around your ankles. Life Force. <laughs> Tobey Hooper's only good movie that wasn't actually directed by Steven Spielberg. That was a sci-fi horror. Yeah, I think so. It wasn't as claustrophobic, though, because it mm. went places and did things. Well, darn. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would, I would say it's the same thing. There's that kind of... And some of those... You know, it's like Alien and then there's Aliens, which... Uh, Military science fiction. Yeah, it changed the style of it, you know. And I don't know what you would say Predator was. It's kind of a scary alien trying to kill you. 
but it was more of an action film than it was a scary alien one. But I, don't, I think we're kind of getting off track here. I'm sorry, we are. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? Thank you. We had already realized that. Chalupa for you, Rish. All right. <clears throat> and just a second ago, I was inviting him in here. Uh, no, okay, I, I guess I was trying to equate the story to movies, and I always do that. That's, right, that's, that's right. my, one of my many flaws. Uh, Ayub Kote. But I, I, I like the let's find a ship, a derelict ship, or go aboard another ship and something is wrong. Something that shouldn't be there is there. Something that wants us, wants us dead, wants to become us. That kind of stuff is endlessly scary to Don't me. Don't endless... touch it. It's evil. evil. Yes. Something that like good. that. It was just neat to have a story sent us that was one of those. We have done the, the, the space fantasy. We have done the Western space tall tale comedy with lots and <laughs> lots of sex. We've got one coming up that uh, is a space love triangle of sorts uh -huh. and, and stuff like that. You know, because we're what Escape Pod was when it first started that does horror and science fiction and fantasy, we have just a huge array of Western we can do of stories, you know, of, of genres and mixes of genres. And something that bugs the crap out of me is when they run a story on Escape Pod and their listeners complain that it should have been on a pseudopod or they run a story on Podcastle and they're like, that wasn't fantasy. <laughs> you know, I, the, the, the fact that we've got a wide array of, of stuff that we can do. I mean, like Maps of the Bible, what would you say that was? Was there a genre on that? Well, it did involve a ghost, so maybe you could say it was a fantasy story. Okay, I guess so. I, you I'm can't not, say it was horror. Yeah, it wasn't a scary ghost. What about uh, on the same track as Maps of the Bible, but same author, different story. Um, I'll break your arm if you say flea langer. No. Book Scouts. Uh, Scouts. Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim. What was that genre? That's got to be fantasy, too. It was about science fiction novels and stuff, but... What would you call Crap Hound? We didn't do Crap Hound. Oh, I'm, I'm but, sorry. Uh, that's Anyhow. actually kind of easy. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the whole... What was it the Sting used to call that when people would say, That's rock. That's country. That's rap. Oh, you'd call that ghettoization of music, uh, where you're saying you have to say that this is this, and you have to do that. Yeah, you have to because, live by the rules. Because people like to organize things? People don't want spillover? I, I, don't, I, I, I never understood why. Although sometimes you'll turn on a pop station, and there's a song that's obviously country, and what it's doing on there. You know, if I Crossover. die young, bury me in satin or whatever. You hear that song and it's like, why is that on a pop station? And so I guess I'm guilty of it too. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're going through and tagging all your MP3s in iTunes, you want to give them the right genre. One time, you know, you sent me an email where you were talking about those Taylor Swift songs that she sang with Def Leppard. And you're like, where the hell do I put these? I can't put them in the 80s folder really because that's not quite right and i can't put them in the country folder because that's not really quite right because they're def leopard songs and i don't know what to do and you slapped me over the phone i did i reached right through with an i am and i used one of those emoticon slaps but what's the solution though i mean if, if your solution is we'll put it under the artist swift or leopard man or <laughs> deaf or taylor <laughs> I would... You make a folder that's them two together, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think that is what happens. But I pick one usually as the uh, the main artist. And I think in that case, Taylor Swift won out because it was really about Taylor Swift. Def Leppard was just the uh, dinosaurs they trotted out to uh, give her some backing. All right. As much as I love Def Leppard, that, that's the case. But back onto the uh, point that we were making, that's one of the things that I made sure that back when we started this show years ago, before we had gray hair and these long beards, yeah, that was one of the things that I stamped my foot and I said, there is no way ever that we will ghettoize our stuff. We're speculative fiction or 
whatever we want to call it, Ooh, which includes, it's an inclusionary thing. It, it brings in all the different ones that might have some kind of interesting element to it, be it science fiction or horror or fantasy. I want all of that combined because, yeah, just like you, that was the thing that irritated me the most. You go to the discussion boards and all the discussion about a story was, is it really a science fiction story or should it have been a fantasy story? Who cares? Talk about the story, not where to ghettoize it made sure you know even if we get to the point where we have six mm, listeners yeah dozens of stories you know we're, we're putting out dozens of stories a month they would still all come out from the same podcast we would not split off and have separate feeds for separate things and You'd, you know what i like about that scenario that they have somehow managed to clone me <laughs> Let's see. There, there, there's a number of things we can talk about on this one. And and what's neat is that Brian's probably going to talk about things, too. Um, so good night, everybody. Um, <laughs> this guy, uh, Lance, from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh-huh. Philippa Ballantyne, our, our Harper actress, also from New Zealand, right? Yes. And, and was that just a radical coincidence? Or was it I, I by think design? It, I think it kind of was because uh, her character was originally cast to somebody else. And that person was unable to uh, to make the time to get the uh, lines done. So they had, she had to be recast. Well, thank and Thor, Philippa was not too good for us this time. Because she turned in a kick at, uh, I'm sorry, butt kicking performance, I thought. Well, and it was just neat to hear an accent. Why do you say yeah, most definitely. I really enjoyed uh, her performance. I, everybody in this show did a great job. Really cool to hear all the different accents Brian managed to round up. I, I thought that even my cheesy, gravelly, big cave guy sounded good. I think he lowered the pitch on my voice to make me sound even tougher because Ernie just doesn't sound all that tough. Ernie! Ayub uh, Kote. Yeah, Ayub Kote was pretty darn good, too. I don't know why, but I'm just going to keep saying Ayub Kote as like yeah. a non sequitur during tonight's episode. Okay. Because it's a cool name. <laughs> yeah, that it is. It was interesting to hear a guy whose name is Ayub Kote speak with a Scottish accent. He screamed with a Scottish accent, too. What, what was his character's name, too? Was it? I want to say his character was Garibaldi. <laughs> Which I don't know if that fits as a Scottish guy, but it is way in the future. So who knows how people are going to move from place to place and wind up with different accents. But it was really cool to hear uh, all the different accents put together into one big crew. It was almost like a Star Trek episode or something like that. Yeah, well, we tried to make this one a little bit more multicultural. I can't really say multiracial because it's audio. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And, yeah, that's something that we could talk about maybe after the, the show. The trying new things, and let's see. You know, the, what, Brian picked this story because it was a challenge, you said. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes what you've got to do. It's easy to pick the story where I can be me and you can be you, and that's all we need to do. But to come up with a character and say, okay, this is the accent I'm going to do for it, and somebody somewhere might not like that accent... I don't know. I, I heard Singh and I heard Brogan and I thought, are people going to think these two sound too much alike? And I get super critical about that on my own stuff. But it was, it was like that one story we did with the Scottish. You got to try. You got to roll the dice and say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to do this. JFK said, we, we go to the moon and do these other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And that's something that... Uh, <laughs> Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, Rish opens his mouth. Okay. I, I, the, the last week we talked a little bit about Comic-Con and you said, well, okay. sure, surely you have other things you want to say. And I said... Hell no, Big Anglovich. <laughs> uh, so opening it up for the don't call me Shirley thing. But I, it was like that. I was like, oh, really? Was there other stuff I, I wanted to say? And you said, well, you called me and you talked about all these things. I would think you'd want to talk about them on the air. And, and now it's been so long that the only thing I can remember is that Kevin Smith came out. And 
each Saturday night or something like that, uh, he has a question and answer where he just comes out and he talks and he says cock a bunch of times. Uh And there's never anything enlightening or anything particularly moving or insightful that happens at those Kevin Smith things. You know, it's just always lots of dick and fart jokes. Okay. But this time he came out and he was talking about retiring from filmmaking and just wanting to do other things and wanting to do his podcast. But before he retired, he he wanted to make this horror movie. And people were like, why do you want to do that? Why? Why would you make a a horror movie? Why would you finance it yourself? And, And what he wanted to do was he wanted to distribute it himself. And they'd be like, why? And he says, for all these years, I'm always surrounded by people who say, why? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to write it for a comic book? Or why do you want to make this you know, kind of thing? Or why do you make a cartoon of whatever it is? Or why do you want to do podcasts? And, that, and he's like, God, I'm so sick of being surrounded by people like that. I want to be around somebody that says, why not? Sure, why not? Let's do that. If you, you want to try it, why not? And he's like, that's what 20 years in the business or 18 years or however long it's been has taught me is, is don't be around those why people because they suck away all of your ambition and all of your, your, your courage to try something that you've never tried before. You got to seek out these people that say, why not? Sure. Let's, let's try it. And if we fail, we'll have learned something or at least we'll have failed upward. Right. And it was so weird to be inspired by Kevin Smith, (laughs) but he was talking about it. And I felt myself going, wow, yeah, you know, why not kind of thing? Because just before Comic-Con, I'd been telling you, oh, I I was thinking of writing this sketch and I was thinking of writing maybe a short film about Transformers. I was thinking about doing a story with like gay sex in it and stuff like that on the show, but I'm afraid of what people are going to think. And after listening to Kevin talk, I was like, you know what? I am going to do that Transformers thing. And I know that's going to be work and it's going to be a headache and maybe nobody's going to laugh. But I'm going to do it anyway just to be able to say, hey, I did it. It's better to say I did it and nobody came than, boy, that would have been neat. But we never did it. We'll never know. Right. And then this story where I was just like, gosh, what are people going to think? People are going to make a stink or whatever, say I'm going to quit the show because gay people aren't people. And I was like, no way. I, you know what? I'm going to do this thing and if, because it's hard, because, it's, because other people aren't going to do it. And if people are upset, well, at least we did it. You know what I mean? Instead of being a coward and saying, gosh, my grandma, if she were alive today, probably wouldn't approve. And so I came out of that speech and I think I called you and I was like, wow, you never would have guessed, but I'm all pumped up and, <laughs> and excited about doing things thanks to Kevin Smith. The world's laziest filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, he got me thinking. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to. I mean, uh, we had a conversation two or three months ago with our mutual friend Ian, who was saying that you know, too bad you're too lazy or much of a pussy to be a screenwriter anymore. Remember? And it really bothered me. Uh-huh. And instead of going and putting my head in the oven, I was just like, you know what, bullcrap! I'm going to write a script, even though I don't do that anymore. The whole Kevin Smith thing, it's it's it, it's fed into that, you know. And I'm nearly done with this script. And and I, maybe I would have finished it anyway, but I wouldn't have finished it so soon if it weren't for this. Th- maybe it's a creative spark or or, or uh, just a, a little shove of go out and do this, go out and be who you could have been. It doesn't have anything to do with dark detour, really. It is, except it is a dark for, detour, though, from what we were talking about. It certainly is. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. We have had creative fatigue about the show. We've had stories that we've rejected because they were just too darn hard to adapt. There was a a musical story where it had three or four songs that had to be created and recorded and played during the story where it's just like, gosh, this is such a good story. We can't set aside a month and a half on one story. I'm sorry, kind of thing. Sometimes the tendency is to... Well, I'm just going to have big edit this. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, 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 there will be times when I'm like, okay, where's the easy solution? And there's something to be said for avoiding that easy solution and going for the hard road, the bumpy road, the long and winding road oh. to get you to a better destination, a better view, or hell, it might even be the same exact place that the, the shortcut got you. 
But I think you and I agree that the stuff that we're putting out now is better than the stuff we put out in our first year, at least technically, at least in the level of production, at least in the fact that they all try and sound like they're in the same room, that there's levels of sound effects, that there's music, that there's, you know, just competency that goes yeah. way up just from doing stuff. We've definitely learned some lessons along the way, for sure. And anyhow, I'm sorry, I've been chattering and chattering, but you know me and you know that I am timid and that I'm, I'm, I'm nervous and, and, and skittish and I don't dare put myself out there. I don't want to send out my stories because somebody might not like them or, you know, it's just, it's a flaw. We talked about it in a couple episodes, the Spandau Ballet episode, <laughs> one of two, I think, of just you know, what if I'm rejected so I don't even go to the dance? Start it up again? It's just a good song. But I'll put the Paul Anka version on there. Heck, where is it coming from is the real question. It just starts up. Weird. Okay, sorry, go on. But you've got to overcome that, especially when you recognize what your flaws are and yet you're unwilling to overcome them or unwilling to address them. And I don't know that I'm ever, like I said, you know, I'll be 70 years old and still afraid to send out my stories. What a horrible idea. What a horrible <laughs> thought that could be. But anyhow, I, I told you recently, I'm never going to edit a story again. Just a, 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 maybe our, our incentive <laughs> episodes, maybe something that I've written for just you and me to be funny or whatever. But somebody sent us a submission that I read over the weekend. And I was like, hell, I want to do this. I want to edit this. <laughs> came out of retirement as quick as Brett Favre does. <laughs> yeah, I guess all it takes is the right story where it's like, gosh, I would regret it if somebody else got to edit this and they did it a different way than I hear it in my head. And, and that's not to say that if Tobias Queen edited that story, it wouldn't be good. It would still be good. But it's just like, I hear it. I want it to be a certain way. And so I'm planning on doing that story. All thanks to Kevin Smith. No, I, I don't know how much of it had to do <laughs> with that. But, you know, sometimes you'll know what you have to do or you'll know what you want to hear. And it just takes the right person saying the right words. And you're like, thank you. I knew that already. I just I needed to hear somebody else say it. I mean, there's a reason why they have uh, cheerleaders in the world and things like that. Sometimes it takes a little just some positive comments, something to get you going. To keep you shooting for that end zone, Brett Favre coming out of retirement. I'm sorry, the uh, I the football, and I I don't I don't I don't narrate NFL films stories. I, I sorry, I don't, we cut that. I, That's not in the episode. Okay, but that is for you if you want it. Oh. So anyways, sometimes it takes that kind of stuff. And that's why we were talking about positive feedback and stuff like that a few weeks ago. You, you know, there's enough tearing people down in any of the entertainment industries, you know, in the film business, in writing novels, in music, et cetera. There's always people that are there to tell you that you're not good enough, that you've got no future. You know, it gets hard. Maybe you can't take that. that no but, one uh, in the history of Hill Valley has uh, ever. <laughs> sometimes just a little uh, encouragement is all, all you need. Something where somebody says, hey, why don't you just say why not and go for it? And maybe it's Kevin Smith. Maybe it's somebody else. You know, you wouldn't expect Kevin Smith to be lifting you up. But sometimes even he can go there. Sometimes we try and do that. Go. Go for it, folks. You can do it. There. We, we did our part. Or at least I did my part. You can do it, Rudy. <laughs> it's important to help people just keep after it and tend to do the, the hard thing. Well, okay. Take Lance young he said this was the first time dark detour had appeared uh-huh although i think we've deleted that part where i read that stupid line which wasn't supposed to be read oh well but, but now people are hearing it fives of people are listening to his story <laughs> and hopefully you know those people like it as much as i do but i don't think this was the first story that lance had sent us right i think he sent us a story a while back and we rejected that story and my life would be grayer if he had said okay well screw those guys or screw this whole writing thing or whatever kiwis say and said i'm not going to send them anything else maybe they say bollocks no that's just english folks that say that huh 
I don't know. I mean, you know what? I've never known a kiwi. Really? Not in a biblical way. Yeah. But, but you watermelon. Eaten a kiwi. Oh, see what you did there? I was making one terrible joke. You made a worse one. I, I, I don't know if that's a good example or not. But the guy sent us another story, and we did accept that one. And the proof's in the pudding. The, the story was good. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, maybe that can be inspiration. Me, I'm, I'm not able, usually, to send somebody a second story. Oh, they rejected me once. Or, you know, the girl wouldn't dance with me, and now it's... Gosh, why did I choose that Brian Adams song on the other? I mean, it was just the first thing that jumped in my head. And then when I inserted the Brian Adams song, I was like, oh, no, this isn't the song I was thinking. Of. <laughs> uh, I think it was Heaven by Brian Adams that I was thinking of because that's a slow dance song. Somebody is. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a little fast. Shoot, I got to cut out all this stuff talking about an earlier episode. But, uh, yeah, I've never been one to pop up from rejection and go and try again. But now you've got an example of a, of a reason why you should right here. That same editor who said, nah, I didn't like that last story might say, wow, not only do I like this story, but I want to be the one to produce it, which you did say, and I still gave it away to Brian. <laughs> And you cursed my name for weeks on end. Did I really? You did, yes. You actually went so far as to go to a witch's shop to try and get her to actually curse me. And she talked you out of it, which was good. Because my family wouldn't have dealt well with the curse. Well, the, the witch cursed you in another way. <laughs> the, the ability to try, try again is admirable. And it's, it's necessary in every person's life, I, I think. I, I tried to make the connection to, you know, job interviews or whatever, but there's a million things of being aggressive or being the kind of person who goes and, and, and pursues what they want. And not everybody's like that. Not everybody is extroverted or, or, or willing to put themselves out there to risk comfort for what they truly desire. But I think the, the most successful people in the world are the ones that can do that. They can right. put aside their personal sense of, of comfort or safety to grab the greater goal. And uh, again, this is a rerun. Uh, if you <laughs> have figured out how to do that, please let me know. This is a rerun. You know, listening to you tell the story about Kevin Smith has actually somewhat inspired me. I feel like I, I, I need to get out and, and do that too and say why not and be the guy that works harder than the others so that I can actually uh, get somewhere. Well, in, in, an, a related, in a related story... This just handed me. 800-pound man swallows own head. No, in a related story, a fat big Anklevich has been doing all he could to get into shape and to lose all this weight and to become a circus strongman or something. And... I mock the crap out of you <laughs> because I can see you suffer and I'm an empathetic person. I'm one of those people where it's just like, oh, poor Big is it's hungry. And <laughs> I'm just not good at this podcasting thing. I realize this is our second episode and we'll get better, folks. Yeah. You know, I, I mock the crap out of you, but the intestinal fortitude that you've shown because you've done all these exercise things and now you've absolutely sworn off anything that tastes remotely good. <laughs> and we did this hike tonight. That was fun, though. I mean, we had a full moon and it's the end of summer and we decided to climb a mountain instead of follow the road that we usually do on our walk. Uh, gosh, why didn't I talk about this before? For the first time ever, <sighs> we took the story with us. You had a little device. Uh-huh. It has a speaker it's built, built into, into it. it. So. Yeah, I know. It's this newfangled thing. It's like a telephone without a cord. Oh. It's a boom box. There you go. <laughs> and we went to it the weighs top 50 of the pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it on my shoulder. Oh, well, it was the equivalent of that, except for very, very, very tiny. And I wouldn't have been able to do it. I, I have an MP3 player, but it doesn't have an external speaker. Uh -huh. Anyway, we went to the top of the hill and we listened to Dark Detour so that we could talk about it. And there was lightning flashing far in the distance and the planes going overhead and pumas smelling us and then walking That's away. That's right. That was so cool. And scorpions stinging our toes as we sat. <laughs> Well, I, I had tennis shoes on, or trainers, as you would say. And, but it, it, was, it was an exertion. It was beyond what we normally would do. And once we got to the top and you were going, <gasps> you said, oh, I didn't tell you. I've been sick for the last four days. 
But getting to the top of that hill and seeing, like, there's a lake in the distance and you could see the full moon reflected on the lake. I mean, it was one of those moments where you're like, wow, look around. It was worth the sweat of climbing up that right. thing. And so often that's what life is. It's like, oh, geez, that's a lot of work to climb up there. But once you're up there, you're like, wow, I never would have seen any of this stuff. It hurts when I urinate, but it's so worth it to be standing <laughs> up here. Sorry, I couldn't quite sell that. Totally worth it. Okay, I am going to shut up and let you and announcer man talk amongst yourselves. Me and announcer man? Okay, just you. <laughs> What do you got to say, announcer man? That brings us to the end of the show. Wait, wait, wait. You you should have listened to the last episode. It was like two and a half hours long, announcer man. Good night, everybody. Oh, you're going to do that. Okay. Um, we've gone all over the place. I know. I, I was, guess I was trying to put a bow on it and, and tie it together and just say sometimes the things that are hard are more valuable than the things that are easy. That's definitely true. And as far as that goes, I mean, you call Kevin Smith the laziest filmmaker there is but that may be the case now but this guy went out and made a movie on his own clerks was an independent film he didn't have studio backing and lots of money right he just maxed out a bunch of credit cards yeah he, he just went for it he did this all on his own he made this film and uh if he hadn't done that would we even know who kevin smith was i don't think so no if, if Clerks hadn't taken off, and I, I remember back in the day when Clerks was new, I saw some kind of ad, and maybe it was in Variety. I don't remember where it was in, but it was talking about how Clerks, because it was so cheap and how much money it had made, it was actually the biggest percentage-wise grossing film ever. You oh, know, and it showed okay. Titanic, which cost this much and only made this much, but Clerks cost this much and made this much. And, uh, you know, if it hadn't taken off like that, he wouldn't have been doing anything but flipping burgers somewhere. We wouldn't know him as the laziest filmmaker ever because he wouldn't be a filmmaker. He would just be some dude, you know. And if, if he hadn't gone out and taken that risk and done the hard thing, who would he be? We'd be like, Kevin Smith? You mean Kevin Williamson, right? Oh, the Dawson's Creek guy? Kevin James. The zookeeper? You mean Kevin... Costner, right? I, I don't know who the this Kevin guy. Smith is. Uh, you mean Kevin Durant? I I guess I haven't heard of Kevin Durant. Uh, yeah, I guess that probably would be the case. That derailed the conversation. Announcer man? This conversation has derailed. <laughs> Thank you. It's almost as though he's the third co-host of the show. Yeah. <sighs> Okay. Yeah, so, so so Kevin Smith gave me something, you know, other than a dirty punchline. And we recorded the dialogue for that Transformers thing today. and uh, Took the pictures last week. Right. It's work. And nobody's going to think it's funny but me, I promise. <laughs> but it's better to do it and fail than to fail to do it. Wow, look at you. Pulling some wordplay. So used to ass play here. Thank oh. you, Kevin Smith. <laughs> Said, come back when you got some class. <laughs> it's like the poster board for birth control. All right, so uh, looks like we're about out of time here on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Thank oh, 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 you for oh. listening. Before we go, uh. please donate. And and also, Dune Steve. That Dune Steve, that, that word, it just scratches at the back of my brain all the time. Please. Please finally tell me what that word means. Well, speaking of scratching, uh, it actually, it's named after a famous baseball player. His name was Dwight Lefty Doonstief. Oh, professional baseball? Yeah, yeah. He was, it turns out, the first baseball player to spit and scratch himself on the field. Ooh. Personal hero of mine. The, the man changed my life. <clears throat> All right, Excuse moving me. on. Big, what are you doing? Oh, oh, come on, man. Ew. I guess that brings us to the end of the episode. They can't all be winners, folks. But, <laughs> but somewhere in there, in the rambling, there was a point, and it was a good one. And I just, I hope that somebody somewhere was able to translate that into something positive. Don't surround yourself with the why people. Surround yourself with why not people that will help you, that will enable you, that will allow you to challenge yourself, that maybe will challenge you. 
to be better, to, to, do, to do more. And there are enough people that will say, get out of here, kid, you got no future, to continue on the Back to the Future thing, to say, don't be a writer or don't be don't, a filmmaker. Don't, don't send that out. Don't open yourself up for rejection. I mean, why bother? You're never going to get any better. You're a talentless butthole and you're not all that attractive. Right. I, I don't know why people continue to hang out with me. <laughs> you, you, you need to be with somebody who says you have a little bit of talent and somebody out there might sleep with you. That's yep. what you need. There you go. You have a little bit of talent and if you get lucky, you might earn a whole lot of money and then someone might be willing to sleep with you. <laughs> That's good advice, Marty. It's something to live by. Thanks for listening, folks. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Good night. See ya. Adventure, excitement, Jedi craves not these things. Nice one. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. I'm sorry, worst episode ever. <laughs> Take two. So, uh, yeah, the, the story Dark Detour has not previously appeared in any other publication. And his name is pronounced just like it appears. We probably can cut that part out. I sharded. There. Was that sexy English? <laughs> it, it was, yeah. So hot. You got half of an erection already, don't you? <laughs> yeah. You kind of... It's a whole one for me, but for any other man, it would be <laughs> Oh, I see. From the cramped confines of his command console on the Nomad's Bridge, Spock turned to Harper. He's all about the amongst. Well, okay, well, let's have the drinking game on that, too. <laughs> How many times does Lance Young use the word amongst? Two so far, in case you're playing at home. Uh. Here, here. Lock on to Priam's... Priam, you said? Priam. Okay. Lock on to Priam. <laughs> Lock on to Priam's upper drocking ring. Lock on. Okay. Did I get it wrong? You said drocking. <laughs> Acknowledged. That was very feminine. Good job. Would you like to go upstairs? <laughs> How many times do you hit the console? You, this is the third. We, the other drinking game. Whenever Brogan hits the console, you take a drink. That's cool. Okay, let me thump it. Cave slapped him on the shoulder. Wow. That was more than I was expecting. Well, it had to be hard for you to be able to pick it up. <laughs> You're like, oh, his shoulder. Oh. <laughs> Brogan tossed a torch down a torch. <laughs> what? Uh, do you want to say tossed him down a torch or tossed a torch down to him? Oh, I farted. Don't do it in the middle of me reading. Only when I've screwed up. Just don't fart. That'll actually is the best way to go. We'll just make that a rule. New rule. Can I borrow no, your butt plug? No Australian accents and no farting. <laughs> I was going to say, we haven't had him yet, have we? No problem, boss. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Don't do that voice because the echo is scary. No, just don't do anything so awful that he can't use it if something happens. Bloody refrigerator turned on again. I fire at your refrigerator. Boss, they're not dead. They're only mostly, mostly dead. dead. That's so weird. I had the exact same <laughs> thought. How come do you make um, all captains of space going vessels Australian? This isn't or Australian, this is English. Kiwi. Oh, sorry. Accented. It sounds Australian? <laughs> I don't know. It sounds kind of... It just reminds me a little bit. Not that much, I guess, when it comes down to it, of your... Uh, <laughs> What's funny captain. is somebody's going to be like, oh, that guy knows how to do an Australian accent. <laughs> God damn it. I'm trying to do... <laughs> it's not Australian at all. Oh, he farted. Uh, you broke the rule. Oh, no. 
The most prominent was a pen stuck in his forehead. Damn. And Crom- a stapler in his anus. As far as he was concerned, this ship was his birthright. He'd be damned if he'd let some greasy yellow alien get his filthy hands on his birthright. He'd be damned if some alien was going to take it from him. So he hid it the one place he knew he could hide something. He fired wildly into the crowd and hopped. I think he hoped, actually. (laughs) I thought he was hopping. I didn't... They sure as hell went out for a blowjob. What was the line? (laughs) I don't know. Ah. I lost my place, too. There we go. Seeing feigned laughter. Ha ha ha. There's been a lot of feigned laughter in this story. I don't know what how sing should sound. <laughs> That's pretty funny though. <laughs> they called Sing a woman like three times. <laughs> Brogan and Harper ran to the nearest viewport, cursing to each other. Damn it! Bloody hell! Damn it! Come on! Bloody bloody go go! go. Bollocks! <laughs> Have I told you about the the book that I'm listening to right now? Um, oh, it's YA, so they put some stupid word in there in out of context. They keep using barking all the time. Uh, it started with just saying that person's barking mad, and then they just say that person's barking. And now instead of saying freaking, they say barking this and that. But the best part is when they don't curse say it. Don't and they say, say barking spiders. That's why I was going to... Okay, that, so that could be the Harper's curse. Bucking spiders! Come on, come on. Bucking spiders! I saw him. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> the Nomad's two main cannons fired into the century-old starboard. The Nomad's two main cannons fired into the centuries-old... The Nomad's... The Nomad's two main cannons fired into the century-old starboard. <laughs> Did that sound better? Saying starboard a little less... Rushed? You. Starbird. Ooh, hey, that sounded cool. Starbird. What? <laughs> it just sounds like I'm saying starboard. Starburns. Spired into the centuries old forecastle on the mizzen mast at the poop deck. The nomad shook violently from the close proximity. Why won't it die? said Brogan. Maybe it can't die. Oh, that doesn't help a lot, does it, Harper? Maybe it can't die. Get over here. Sorry. Uh, oh. But I can control it better now. Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, he must have said something different at some point, and then he forgot to change it. Because that doesn't make any sense at all. What should he say instead of, don't we all? <laughs> that just makes me think of, like, that. we used to always joke about people in high school. We'd be like, hey, what's up, man? And they go, pretty good. <laughs> it's just, like, not the right response. It's like, hey, how's it going? Not much. How's it hanging, man? Yes. <laughs> Good luck, Brian. May Thor uh, watch over, watch and keep you, dude. May Thor guide your footsteps. Lance Young. Sounds like a porn name. It could be. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Dawn Detour sounds like. Never mind. That's uh, Young Lance. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, the the story Dark Detour has not previously appeared in any other publication. And his name is pronounced just like it appears. We probably can cut that part out. I sharded. I'm flattered by the author offer, but I'm not really interested in recording the author's note. Oh, wait, I don't think you were supposed to read that part. Don't remember there being any particularly complicated words, but if there are, please let me know and I'll tell you how they're pronounced. This is an overshare, really. (laughs) How are we supposed to pronounce technically? (laughs) Oh, you bastard. The dead of Tetra (laughs) Manor. Let's see if Brian gave us a... After this story, the cast list. 
can't believe we'd get away with that. Stop farting. It's gonna have lots of outtakes and none of them are gonna be funny. We should do a search for him as soon as we're done with this. Well, I can... No, but that's Twitter. I want nothing to do with Twitter. Spider bunt, spider bunt. But hopefully Brian will talk about how he determined whether one was appropriate whether to drop was or not. Because yeah, I wanted to kick him in the fudging face when he kept dropping those. But uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> really, Sorry. no. Uh, that was that was a harsh reaction. I wouldn't have expected that. I'll 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 snip that bit, just like the doctor should have done to you. Would you mind calling up what my uh, notes what to you, you were about? about? You said, I hate this story and the douche who wrote it. I did, and I feel bad that you have to air my dirty laundry that way, but, you know, I got to stand by my statements. Young Lance is obviously a porn name. <laughs> I'll probably snip that bit, as you should have been. Sorry. Twice. All right, never mind. <laughs> okay, we'll just snip that bit as you should have been. Well, I'm not polluting the gene pool, sir. There's something to be said for avoiding that easy solution and going for the hard road, the bumpy road, the long and winding road oh. to get you to a better destination, a better view, or hell, it might even be the same exact place that the, the shortcut got you. But, you know, that's that's why we got three Parsec nominations. Oh, and they don't. No, I, to you. I'm cutting that line. I, 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 don't, I don't like that. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.